Welcome to the show. I am Chris Graham, and uh, we're going to talk some politics today. Our guest is Ken Mitchell. Ken is running for Congress in the 6th Congressional District, and uh, he's the Democratic nominee. He'll be challenging Ben Klein uh, in the November election, and uh, we'll talk with Ken about that. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here with you. So uh, we'll talk about your career uh, in in so many things, the military uh, and then in private business, uh, construction and working at Monticello. But, you know, as I was pouring through uh, your your history, your your biography there, Ken, I noted that, um, you know, you had settled down. Uh, you had decided to retire organic farming in Rockingham County. And and what brought you out of of retirement and back into the public sphere, so to speak, was the events of January sixth. Um, talk to me about your motivation to decide to run for Congress and how that related to uh, the events of January sixth, twenty twenty one. Well, as as we look at the, uh, January the sixth, um, th that that is just a just a unconscionable uh, event that occurred. And when we look at, uh, you know, fundamentally the free and fair elections that were being challenged there, you know, and that is just a core, core principle of democracy. And, and to have that occur and to have setting members of our House and Senate that, that took the conduct and the action that they took was unconscionable to me. And it's not just one six that motivated me. When you start to look at the um, the obstructionism, the chaos, and all the divisiveness that is coming out of one of our parties, that to me is not a strong democracy. And we, and, and you know, we have men and women that have fought and died for democracy, and we cannot let it die the way it is, that it would die a slow death through being strangled by obstructionists and stuff like that. And when you see the 118th Congress being the most unproductive Congress in modern history, that is simply unacceptable. People expect our, our elected officials to get in there, do their jobs and legislate and not try to be up there grandstanding to get airtime and television time and things like that. We need to bear down, do the hard work for the people. We're recording this interview on April 17th, a day ago. Um, uh, members of the House uh, Republican leadership, uh, including uh, Ben Klein, who is a member of the uh, management team for the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, we can talk about grandstanding. They, they walked over from the House to the Senate uh, to formally present those articles of impeachment. Um, it stands out that that your opponent, Ben Klein, is someone who on January 6th, a few hours after the attempted insurrection by um, uh, an angry mob uh, who had been whipped up by former President Trump, Ben Klein voted uh, to decertify the election. Uh, he has continued to uh, stoke those uh, claims uh, since January 6, 2021. Um, he's he's someone who is not just a, a, a backbencher who uh, is coasting on, uh, you know, where things are right now with that Republican Party. He's very actively someone who is an obstructionist. So how is, how important is it for you to do what you're doing to give six district voters a chance to to, to speak out and, 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 and maybe send someone to Congress who who will stand up against the obstructionist? Well, Chris, I think you hit uh, on the the very reason that I'm running here, and that is to not just to support the few that stand with Ben Klein in this district, but to support everyone in the sixth district. You know, I learned some valuable lessons while serving in the military. You know, one of one of the creeds we had was to leave no one behind. And that's where I stand. That's one of my core principles running for office is that we leave no one behind and that we're inclusive of everyone in this district. Even if they don't vote for me, my obligation, my oath to, to the office will be to support them equally. And that's what I think the expectation is of the citizens of the 6th District to have a fair representative that is principled, has values, and has those values for everyone, not just some. 
You know, one thing that has frustrated me about the representation uh, in the 6th District, but not just from Ben Klein, but from uh, Klein's predecessor, Bob Goodlett, is it, it's felt to me for many years that um, our representative in Congress from the 6th District has not really represented the 6th District well, in a sense. You know, this th this district has very specific needs that don't really fit the rubric of what the National Republican Party has decided uh, and, and and those gentlemen have have voted consistently in lockstep with the Republican Party, in my mind, against the interests of the 6th District. I want to get your thoughts. Um, what are the most important issues uh, for 6th District voters that that you could do a better job representing than the current representative in Congress does? Well, uh, you know, the 6th dif District, as you know, is a very, very large district, you know, s stretching all the way from the north in Frederick County, Winchester, through the, through the center with, you know, Stanton, Augusta, Waynesboro, all the way down to Roanoke and Salem. So the needs of the district vary, whether it's Roanoke, the largest city west of Richmond, or whether it is Winchester to the north and, and you know, some of its influence from the uh, retirement and, and commuting into Washington. So there's very different fields here in the city, uh, in the center, very strong agricultural things. But where I think they have failed us is in 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 the rural reaches of our of our district, and and you know our rural uh, elements of the district have somewhat been left behind, left behind, for example, in broadband deployment. Uh, you know you can't you can't do precision farming if you don't have broadband. You can't start a home business. Our children in rural areas can't do their homework as effectively and often have to stay later just to have that connectivity. You know, rural hospitals of 29 rural hospitals in Virginia, 20 of them no longer have maternity services. So we see an erosion of, of the services. You know, our, our farming communities and our farmers, you know, they have had tremendous amount of, of strain simply and making ends meet for high cost of operations for fuel, fertilizer, impacts on climate change that uh, affect, you know, uh, they can't get a second or third growth of hay for cattle. You know, they last year we got one growth and, and a lot of farmers had to sell cattle early because they they had to get, you know, they couldn't uh, couldn't feed them and stuff. So there are issues, I think, that affect rural uh, uh, parts of Virginia, mental health, substance abuse. I think all of these things that that look and they and they all plug into the chaos and the divisiveness that has been ongoing. And and I just think leaning into the rural areas in, in the district and not to say that the cities don't have issues. They do. But the rural port parts have been left behind in my mind. And that's what we need to strengthen. And I think by doing that, we we lean into our communities and the common good in our communities and our individually, and we stand for common goals, common purposes, and the commonwealth, if you will. Um, also, uh, as we look at, um, you know, and as I've traveled up and down the district talking with farmers and and small businesses and just just the common ordinary folks they're concerned about the loss of agricultural land and the urban sprawl and development so you know we have we have farms we're losing farms at an unprecedented rate you know here in Rockingham County you know the largest producer the single most uh, largest producer of agriculture in Augusta County second within the within the uh within the district and you know the district uh, it, it produces one third of the agricultural economy for the state. That's an $82 billion industry. So we've got to protect that. We've got to protect our agricultural lands. We protect farm. We, I mean, we protect forests. We protect marshlands. We protect endangered species. It's time we start protecting our agricultural lands that feed this nation. So, you know, I lean kind of into the rural aspect and and I lean into the independent and the moderate Republicans that you know see these as problems and we haven't driven uh, drawn a line where we're divisive over something yeah and that's that's where you know when I, when I look at our country and I look at the politics right now you know there are certainly a lot of folks who are 
hardcore, I guess, you know, the MAGA, uh, the, the hardcore supporters of Donald Trump, but he doesn't get the votes he gets because of the fact that maybe 47% of the people in this country, the, the 47% he got in each of the last two elections are all hardcore MAGA. There's a lot of independent Republicans, as you mentioned, moderate Republicans who maybe feel like there isn't an alternative on the Democratic side. And so they vote with Republicans anyway. Um, how can you reach out to those voters? What are your efforts in that respect to try to say, hey, look, there is an alternative here. You don't have to support someone like Ben Klein who votes lockstep with uh, with Donald Trump, with the Republican leadership that is so divisive. Um, you, you can vote for me and I will represent you uh, in, in Congress in a way that represents your interest. Well, and 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 I think leading from the middle, Chris, not 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 going far right, not going far left, but in the middle where there is common ground, common purpose, leading with some common sense for the common good. So and, and, and I think that's where a majority of us set in the middle. You know, we're we're tired of the divisiveness. We're tired of from both sides. We're, we're tired of that. Now, I lean Democrat because I think the Democratic platform has uh, stands for a strong defense of this nation. You know, we can't let the Republicans hijack that we are equally strong on national defense. We can't let the Republicans try to hijack that we also stand for law and order. You know, they're going to stand up louder and yell louder, but we're going to be there serving, serving you, you know, the people from from a platform that is from the middle. And and I think that's where we will get traction. And I think that's where our message will resonate. We are here not not to be divisive. We're here to be inclusive of everyone. Now, you talked about health care a little bit ago. Um, one issue that certainly is going to come up, uh, it, it will be a, a overriding theme in this campaign season, uh, will be women's health care and particularly reproductive rights. And, and it, they've been under attack, to say the least, ever since the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. Uh, we've seen elections, uh, uh, you know, certainly trend towards Democrats uh, since the 2022 midterms turned out a lot better for Democrats than they historically should have based on uh, historical trends after a, a presidential election. Uh, in, in those midterms, we saw the Virginia state elections last year uh, a, a trend towards Democrats. Um, what are your thoughts there uh, and, and how how that issue will play in your, your challenge to Ben Klein? Well, uh, I, I'm fully, fully 100 percent in support of a woman's right to choose. But I think the issue is a little bit larger than that. This is, uh, you know, where we have been bearing down on women's rights in general. You know, I have two daughters. Michelle has two daughters, all educated in the public system. And we paid full full freight to get them educated. But they get turned out in a world where they'll make 21 percent less than a male does. And I will tell any father and mother out there that that raised daughters, you know, we shouldn't accept that this. And so it's it's bearing down in on women's rights. And it's bearing down on voter rights. It's bearing down on the rights of LGBTQ to, you know, let's treat treat everyone with dignity and respect. And even down to school board levels where they're trying to get into the rights of children and their parents to choose what they want to read. And, and I don't think the right to read a book should be mandated by anyone's religious or personal beliefs. So I, th I think it's rights in general that are being stepped on. And I think as Democrats, we stand for rights and inclusion and equity and those things for all people. So that's where I think the difference will be between Ben Klein and I. He stands with the with the few. I stand with the majority. You mentioned how big this district is. It's it's something you you really see when you drive that 81 corridor and you realize this is one district uh, that goes all the way, like you said, from the Winchester area down to the Roanoke-Salem area. Um, that's a challenge for a challenger like yourself, uh, Ben Klein being the incumbent and riding on the coattails of, of long-term incumbent and Bob Goodlatte. Uh, you have uh, you have a lot of work to do. You have a lot of uh, you can be putting a lot of miles on vehicles the next uh, few months. Um, you, and you've already been doing that. I want to get a sense of what you're hearing as you have been meeting with, uh, you know, the various city and county committees and 
you know, gearing yourself up for the uh, the county fair season and all. You know, we, we talked before we hit record on the podcast here about the Valley League baseball season. I mean, all these things. Um, you know, this is going to be, uh, you know, a, a challenge for you uh, uh, to, to just get up and down this this long district. It, well, it certainly is. And, you know, as I've gotten out and talked with with uh, just the ordinary citizens, as well as the committees and stuff, you know, they are ready for a change. They 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 have they have been. Uh, you know, they, they've tried to divide us and they try to, you know, uh, 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 make us think that we have all of these issues. And, and I tell everyone, I bet you a dollar that we have far more in common than we do apart. You know, when when we look at the true issues and we shouldn't get divided, we can always figure out how to legislate as long as we meet in the middle. Uh, but what I hear from them is the majority, and this is from Roanoke to Winchester, they want to keep the feel of the valley, and they want to make sure that urban sprawl uh, isn't occurring. And, you know, we're, we're losing farmland and farms at an unprecedented rate. And uh, I think working with uh, with the communities and the, you know, the uh, economic councils and and the planning and zoning commissions and things of that nature. We need to take a look at how we can manage the growth within the valley. We have seen growth in Northern Virginia and sprawl into Leesburg and Manassas and and how all of that has 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 sprawled. Uh, we we need, in my humble opinion, instead of expanding horizontally, we need to consider expanding vertically in our towns and stuff and keep our agricultural feel. So that's one of the major issues. And, uh, you know, defending our democracy, everybody is, you know, concerned about making sure that that our democracy remains strong and they're looking for level headed leadership. And I, and I can tell you, leading from the middle, I can reach across the aisle to a Republican as quick as I can, a Democrat, as long as they're leaning into the common good and the legislation is for the good of the people of the 6th District. I will work with anyone. The yeah. challenge is the distance. And uh, it's this isn't the first challenge I've had. You know, I've faced many challenges in the military many challenges in business, and this is just a different kind of challenge. But I'm up to the task, and, and I'm ready to lean into this and give the people of the 6th District another option in leadership. That's, that's a good segue there. I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about your background. I mean, we've, we've talked about business, we've talked about the military, but you have a really interesting background in terms of, of that uh, that I think it's important to share with the listeners out there, the viewers out there on our on our uh, YouTube as well. Just that uh, uh, you know, you come you come with a, a a varied background that can inform how you could really represent folks in D.C. Well, you know, uh, thank you so much. That uh, you you know, I never thought for one moment, Chris, that I would be running for public office. So my background. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a military veteran. Uh, I, I've served 24 years in the military. I served uh, under nuclear surety with all of the uh, clearances and everything that were involved with that. I've served in aviation and telecommunications and, and, and a, even, even within the military, a broad background. Um, the last six years of my service, I uh, served in the White House under uh, Herbert Walker Bush administration, a Republican administration, and the Bill Clinton administration, a Democratic administration. Um, I saw how legislation and democracy uh, were supposed to work and did work. You know, when we had free and fair elections and we saw the, uh, you know, the turnover of one party to another as, as elections occurred and stuff. That was, that was the ground that I grew up in. in, in. Um, I was born and raised in Kentucky country, but I am from a military family. My father served, my brother served, and I served. And jointly, we have 78 years of service between the three of us. All of us retired military. Um, so I'm very proud of that. When I left the military, um, I was in Northern Virginia. Um, I 
worked in the telecom industry during the dot-com boom, building out broadband uh, broadband services in uh, major metropolitan areas. You know, we've gotten to a point now where they have been built out, but the rural reaches of our nation are still being left behind. So I want to take that experience and apply it to rural broadband build out. Um, I left the t uh, corporate world after about six years, moved to uh, near Charlottesville uh, down in North Garden and uh, started my own business in doing historic restorations and renovations. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, the housing boom was going on. And and uh, uh, while I was in business, the housing crisis hit and the banking crisis hit. So there was a downturn in building and all that. But I was in a situation where my experience was in historic. And that kind of led me to working at Thomas Jefferson Foundation Monticello, uh, leading their uh, upgrades of their infrastructure at Monticello and protecting that World Heritage Site. So I worked at Monticello for about six years and was recruited after that by a civil engineering firm where we worked and specialized in water and wastewater systems. So I worked on expanding a wastewater plant in Elkton, uh, the water systems up in Woodstock, uh, stormwater management in Roanoke, build outs in Augusta County down near Joliview. And so uh, a broad aspect of working throughout the district here, as well as the fifth district. So uh, I think all of that uh, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I am the great grandson of a coal miner from McDowell County, West Virginia. So I have some humble roots in that regard. Uh, again, from a military family, I'm the proud father of two daughters, uh, both educated in the uh, Virginia public school systems, a UVA grad and a JMU grad, both uh, pediatric nurse practitioners leaning into the good uh, for, for, for everyone, and uh, the proud uh, grandfather of five grandchildren, uh, three granddaughters and two grandsons. So I think when I take my military experience, my broad business experience, and my life experience and combine them, I think I stand as a very qualified candidate to help lead in, in the the sixth congressional district. That's a that's a wide array of experiences to bring, no doubt about that. Uh, and also the experience of being a rural resident all your life uh, as well. I think that's that's important too. Uh, even you know I'm, I live in a city, I live in the city of Waynesboro, but when you explain to people outside of our district that uh, you know I where you live, they they think that even when you live in a city uh, in, in, this, in this, this part of the state that you're still rural. And you are. I mean, I, I grew up rural as well. I, I grew up in Augusta County, a couple different locations that are very rural. And uh, that that even even us city dwellers uh, uh, know what is what, what what's important here in this part of the state. So, um, well, Ken, uh, you know, this has been really illuminating to learn more about you. And as uh, you know, we're in April now, we have uh, several months until the election. Um, maybe as we're getting ready to wrap up here, just talk about what your next few months will be like. Uh, you know, I, I know for a lot of people, um, you know, th this time of year in terms of a, a political season is, uh, you know, they're not maybe paying as close attention. So uh, they, they start paying more attention in the fall after Labor Day, the traditional, so to speak, unofficial start of the campaign season. But um, for, you know, you'll be out meeting people, you'll be, you'll be doing some of the groundwork, raising money, getting your campaign team together, that kind of thing. What will, what will the next few months be like for you? Well, it, it, the, the truth of the matter, Chris, is it's all about fundraising right now and simply getting out there and getting the recognition, the name recognition. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a lot of time on the phone, uh, working for fundraising, uh, a lot of time getting out, simply meeting the folks in the district and listening to what they have, what their concerns are. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've, I've come to the conclusion that I am a very people 
person oriented individual. So getting out and meeting the people and not just in the cities, but getting out there in the country, you know, being country when when country wasn't cool helps me kind of get out there and relate to them. And again, I tell them that, you know, we have much more in common than we do apart. And when we apply our country common sense, we're going to find that I'm the best choice for for the next uh, congressman for this district. But that's it's going to be fundraising, meeting people and 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 helping and building uh, our campaign team and and different. You know, we've got to have the reaches down in Roanoke and, and up in Winchester and here in the center part, you know, so building that campaign staff up, getting our message out and fundraising. That's what my life consists of right now. Well, I think uh, the people who've listened in on the podcast here, the people who've been watching on YouTube and Facebook, they're going to learn a lot here about you uh, and can't wait to get to meet you in person. Well, Ken, uh, it's been great to meet you today, get to learn more about you. Thank you so much for your time. And we're going to have you back on here again soon. I look forward to it, Chris, and it was a pleasure being with you.